Hello, everyone. My name is Gurjat Basra, and I'm the manager of patient programs, research, and advocacy here at Lymphoma Canada. I hope you were able to access the information you were looking for yesterday in terms of your specific lymphoma subtype. And with that, I'm pleased to welcome you all to the second day of our national patient conference. The first session we have today is titled, What's Coming Down the Pipeline for Lymphoma Therapies? There are many new novel therapies in development for lymphoma, which is exciting for clinicians and lymphoma patients across Canada. This conference session will cover the upcoming treatment options currently being tested, such as cellular and antibody-based therapies. Before we begin, there are a few things I'd like to bring to your attention. So this session is being recorded and the recording will become available following the conference. You will be notified via email. At the end of the presentation, we will leave a few minutes for questions and you can type them in in the Q&A box that should be visible at the bottom of your screen. We'll try and answer as many questions as possible. So without further ado, today we have here Dr. John Carvilla, who is a hematologist and member of the lymphoma program and the autologous blood and marrow transplant program. Dr. Carvilla's research interest is the development of novel therapeutics in lymphoid malignancies and incorporating translational research into clinical trials. He is a lymphoma co-chair for the Canadian Cancer Trials Group, as well as a chair of the Scientific Advisory Board for Lymphoma Canada. So thank you so much, Dr. Carvilla, for joining us today, and I'll hand it over to you. All right, well, thanks a lot, Gurjot, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's really nice to be with you today. Uh, what we're going to do in the next 45 minutes or so is uh, cover this topic, uh, what's coming down the pipeline, lymphoma therapies in development uh, in 2023. And uh, again, nice to be with everyone at our seventh annual National Patient Conference. Uh, here are my disclosures. Uh, again, I, I do a lot of work in the research space, uh, so that involves interacting with a lot of companies uh seeing what drugs are available trying to bring uh, trials to our center to princess margaret as well as to sites in canada when possible and uh, what i'm going to show you in the next little uh, little bit uh, is a take on what we see and i think the the tough thing in all of this with that title what's coming down the pipeline uh, is you can think about things that are very far away in terms of uh, potentially becoming available to patients and also at the same time things that may be quite close and we're waiting for regulatory or payer approval so I am going to try to give you a sense of both things uh, I'm going to use some examples in specific diseases and I'm going to try and give you a little bit of a framework to think a bit about how to approach understanding some of these treatments and their relevance as seen through the lens of someone that does clinical trials yeah so by way of introduction uh, you know, the data is everything to us, so uh, we will see uh, treatments that are earlier in development as well as treatments that are late stage, and I'm going to give you a bit of a flavor about that. But in the background, it's going to be really important to highlight some key concepts uh, that go into how therapies get developed and uh, ultimately hopefully get approved and, and brought into the realm of standard of care treatment. So uh, some of you, if you've seen me talk uh, for Lymphoma Canada before, might have seen this slide before. And this looks at typical drug development uh, from phase one to phase three. And uh, if you're a patient or a family member that's been in a discussion looking at a clinical trial, you know, hopefully that discussion involves identifying what the purpose of the clinical trial is that someone may be considering. In a phase one study, uh, this is really trying to understand what is the right dose of a drug to give? Is the drug safe? And you know potentially some preliminary efficacy. So does the drug work in lymphoma? But in a phase one study, many of those things are unknown and the focus is really on understanding how to dose the drug. In a phase two study, this is looking now, you know some preliminary safety, you know how to give the drug, this is really trying to understand how well the drug works in a specific patient population. And often phase one and phase two clinical trials, when a drug is being first developed, is being tested in uh, patients that have received many standard therapies and may not have good alternatives available. 
But as a drug gets more data behind it, uh, even in a phase two study, it may be moving earlier into the disease and it may uh, at some point be given in combination with other drugs that may be considered standard to try to develop a new standard regimen, not just the drug itself, but the drug in combination. And ultimately in a phase three clinical trial, this is where you look to demonstrate superiority in terms of its effectiveness over what may be considered the gold standard in that specific patient population. And so again, we'll, we'll walk through some of these from an example standpoint uh, in some slides to come. Now, what's happened in the past 10 or 20 years is that stepwise pathway of phase one to phase two to phase three trials has really changed. And part of the reason for that is how slow it can be to take a drug from early phase development to late phase development and then have it available, approved in the standard of care setting. And that really could take up to 10 years. But one of the things that has changed is this idea of accelerated approval. So this uh, was initially uh, because of the FDA and probably came from HIV, where people really needed quick access to drugs in the early days of treating that disease. And in cancer, it really may not be that different. So if you're developing a drug and it shows really promising results and there are no good standard treatments available, then it would be very justified in bringing those treatments uh, to patients in that circumstance. And that may lead to approval of a, of a treatment when there is no good alternative. But that being said, uh, it certainly is important to confirm the efficacy of a treatment like that. And that requires a randomized trial. Uh, so where things have now moved is frequently that um, layer between phase one and phase two or separating those things out that's changed. And now often a phase one clinical trial may include phase two components. So you're looking at spe specific patient subgroups, trying to understand efficacy of a drug. And that may also be a way to get a drug approved and we'll save the bigger randomized questions to confirm benefit against a gold standard for specific phase three trials. What is a successful drug or what is a successful treatment? So if that early signal is seen in a clinical trial, it may be feasible to access that drug in Canada in a couple of different ways. And so access may be in a clinical trial so that it that is a way for us to be able to use drugs uh, that may not be approved or funded in Canada. Uh, there may be the opportunity to access a successful drug compassionately, and I'll touch base on that with some examples moving forward. And combination studies, so if you know a drug works as a single agent, but you want to study it with maybe a treatment we use more in Canada than in the US, if that study is open and, and in Canada, that might be another way for uh, clinicians and, and the patients that they look after to access a drug in that setting. So we think about these things when we when we're designing studies or when we're looking at clinical trials to bring into our our hospitals or our cancer centers as a way for us to access innovative treatments where our standards don't work that well for patients that being said how do we develop drugs and why do we do it um, we need to look at a specific target of a treatment and so you know, there may be a million targets one can think of in a cancer, but what is the reason for doing this? And you can start with the lab and say, what are the preclinical data? So are there experiments in cancer cell lines? You know, are there experiments looking at targets and seeing that if you hit this target, it leads to the death of a, of a cancer cell? These are the sorts of things that are the early steps. And then along the way in preclinical models, you may look at safety, uh, this may ultimately go on to some sort of animal model and in these uh, early uh, steps of developing a drug you know you're trying to better understand the mechanism so it might make a lot of sense that if this treatment hits a specific target that is the clean mechanism of action but when you think of some of the drugs that we use that are aren't chemotherapy immunotherapy we think we may guess the mechanism of the action but that may you know may not really be true and then ultimately, you know, it may be great to have a new therapy that looks very promising uh, in the lab or with early preclinical studies, but you have to have a patient population that needs a treatment. And in lymphoma, uh, we have a lot of different treatments available to people. And so it's more trying to understand 
where is an unmet need? Is there a setting where treatments aren't that effective? Or is there a place that people are running out of options that it becomes more relevant to look at a treatment? So with that as the introduction, uh, in the next couple of slides, I'm going to hit some highlights looking at uh, how to think about these targets. And so one of the ways to do that is to say on the cancer cell itself, and the example on this diagram is a malignant B cell like you might find in large cell lymphoma, follicular lymphoma, CLL, or other common B cell lymphomas. These are targets on the cell surface that we can potentially uh, look at targeting. And the examples here are things like CD19 or CD20 and CD47. And what you can see in the boxes around uh, the malignant B cell there are ways that we can target that. And so a number of these are antibody approaches, right? And so antibodies, uh, again, are things that the body makes to help fight infection. You can create an antibody in a lab. It is a, a type of immunotherapy. So a naked antibody is something like rituximab, and that's uh, been a well-established treatment in lymphoma now for well over 20, 25 years. But when you look at next generation applications of that, so if you attach chemotherapy to it, it becomes an antibody drug conjugate. You can see names listed there. You can see a bispecific antibody. I'll talk, I'll talk about this in a little more detail moving forward. And then you can also see now cellular therapies. So CAR T cells can target an extracellular marker. You need something to bind to. So in this case, CD19, but you may be also giving treatments that can engage uh, other types of cells, NK cells or macrophages. So these are other parts of the immune system and giving treatment may make those more effective. The example here is lenalidomide and an antibody called tafacitumab. And then also a CD47 antibody, which is a checkpoint for macrophages. And again, can you bring a different part of the immune system towards a cancer cell and try to chew it up just like you might with a CAR T cell? So these are some of the examples. Historically, we spent a lot of time working on intracellular targets. And so these are things that are looking at signaling pathways as an example within the cancer cell. And so what you see in the green there is the cell membrane. And these are various cell surface markers that also have downstream signaling pathways. And again, in the red here this time are the number of different treatments that you can use to target various intracellular signaling pathways by you know, targeting as an example, BTK. So BTK inhibitors have really changed uh, how we treat certain types of lymphoma or CLL. You can see a number of examples there. You can look at sick, and this is another target uh, that is a, a protein kinase that a number of drugs have been evaluated against. PI3 kinase or JAK, a gamma secretase there, as you can see on the right, and even the proteasome internally with uh, drugs like bortezomib or carfilzomib, which are more commonly improved in multiple myeloma. So again, one way to think of this then, extracellular targets that you can target more typically with things like antibodies, intracellular targets where we more use these sort of small molecules as a way to get at treatment. And now picking up on a different theme, how do we look at this from a disease specific standpoint uh, so again, these are extracellular targets. So these are cell surface markers looking at a specific target, what we call the immune checkpoint. And so this example here in this cartoon, you can see there are many potential immune checkpoints on T cells. So T cells are part of the normal immune system here. The tumor cell in question might be a Hodgkin's Reed Sternberg cell. And so what ends up happening is we believe that Hodgkin's lymphoma has an upregulation genetically to basically tell the immune system to go to sleep and to ignore the tumor cell. But by blocking this interaction with an antibody, in this case, a PD-1 antibody, can you disrupt that artificial relationship, allow the T cell to wake up and potentially to do the work? So I'll tell you, it's not that simple. The mechanism of checkpoint inhibition in Hodgkin lymphoma is still not that well known but PD-1 antibodies have been well studied. And what I'll show you here, um, this is from the phase two studies that look at checkpoint inhibitors, anti-PD-1 antibodies in patients with Hodgkin's lymphoma that were beyond routine standard treatment. So this is typically third line therapy, but some of these patients 
could even be second line therapy in some cases. And this is using two drugs that are now approved in Canada, so pembrolizumab or nivolumab. And what these show are actually very good results for patients that did not have good standard treatment options available. And again, patients that achieved a complete remission uh, doing a lot better uh, than patients with partial remissions, but still showing significant benefits and leading to the approval of these drugs. What ended up happening thereafter, so this is uh, the one randomized trial that led to ultimately the, approve, the approval of pembrolizumab, this was the confirmatory study uh, versus uh, an older study, uh, an older standard, brentuximab vidotin. I'll come back to that drug in a second. But this is the phase three trial that led to the approval of, of pembrolizumab. And so uh, again, showing here that what was a drug that we thought had a really good efficacy and safety profile based on phase two studies when put to the ultimate test, it was actually better than brentuximab. And this led to the funding around the world, including Canada, for pembrolizumab in Hodgkin's lymphoma. Now, where is this going? So recently, and so this was presented at uh, the ASCO meeting a few months ago by Alex Herrera, a good colleague down in uh, California. And this was a trial that uh, our cooperative group in Canada, CCTG, participated as, in as well is if you add nivolumab to frontline chemotherapy for stage three or four Hodgkin's lymphoma, and you compare it against the previous gold standard, brentuximab vidotin in combination with AVD, uh, which was approved in Canada based on the Echelon 1 clinical trial, what you see here is an improvement in progression-free survival for patients getting nivolumab. And so that what that means is at the time of this study being reported, there was an 8% improvement in being alive and in remission for patients that had received nivolumab in combination with chemotherapy compared to the older standard. So this is very early follow-up of this trial. It was only one year, but we're hoping that these data hold up and that uh, at some point in the future, this will be a study that will lead to the approval of a drug like nivolumab as part of primary treatment for Hodgkin's lymphoma. And again, I've shown you the stepwise progression from a phase two to a randomized phase three in the relapse refractory setting, and now ultimately potentially changing frontline treatment uh, with uh, this very important clinical trial, which we'll hopefully see published uh, in the relatively near future. And as I've mentioned, nivolumab and pembrolizumab are available and funded in relapsed or refractory classical Hodgkin's lymphoma based on some of the data that I've shown you. And data from the frontline study, there are other frontline studies, but none are really randomized or reported in that way. And there is no specific approval frontline uh, in any country to have this as a standard yet. But I think based on these data, we're very likely to see it uh, approved, as I said, hopefully in the not too distant future. Where is the field going? So what else is coming down the pipeline? So there are a couple of other checkpoint molecules beyond PD-1, as I mentioned earlier. LAG-3 is another one that looks to be of interest. And uh, there have been studies looking at this combination treatment from Merck, uh, incorporating pembrolizumab, which is a PD-1 antibody, with a drug called favazelumab. Uh, in this co-formulation of these drugs. And again, the study has been open in a few different centers in Canada, and we've seen some encouraging data there. And there is a randomized controlled trial comparing this against chemotherapy in patients that have had a lot of standard therapy before. And this is a trial that will be open or is open in some centers in Canada already. And we'll hopefully see the development of this exciting combination approach. What else is in development? So another company, AstraZeneca, is developing a bispecific antibody. Again, I'll speak a little bit more about what a bispecific antibody is in some subsequent slides. But targeting PD-1 in combination with another checkpoint inhibitor, this one's called TIM-3, and sort of targeting both of those at the same time with one drug, not two drugs, like the Merck one. There's a phase one study that's currently open at a few centers around the world. We're seeing early signs of response there, and this is a good option for patients that, uh, you know, unfortunately may have Hodgkin's lymphoma after multiple different treatments. And so this is one where, uh, again, this is earlier in development. It's still in phase one. We're trying to understand the right dose and safety of the drug, 
but we're seeing preliminary results and I think it'll be moving forward into phase two and other studies moving forward. So there was an example looking at checkpoint inhibition and what's coming forward in Hodgkin's lymphoma. We're now going to go uh, back to B cell lymphoma and we'll fo focus on some different antibodies here. And as I mentioned earlier, cell surface markers are really get great targets for antibodies and cell therapy. We have a number of examples here. Rituximab, polituzumab is an antibody drug conjugate and is one of uh, several in development. We have anti-CD19 directed CAR T cells, as well as bispecific antibodies. And so to dive into that in a little more detail, antibody drug conjugates, again, as the name speaks to, is a comb are a combination of a chemotherapy, so that's the drug, uh, that's been attached to an antibody. So what this does, it allows direct delivery of chemotherapy to a, a cancer cell and you're able to potentially give a higher dose of the chemotherapy because it's delivered specifically and target that right to the cancer. The originator in the lymphoma space is this drug Brentuximab Vidotin. And uh, again, as I might have spoken to a little earlier, this is a drug that made it all the way, much like checkpoint inhibitors. So approved in relapsed or refractory disease, confirmed in relapsed disease after transplant, and now a frontline study uh, showing benefit over traditional chemotherapy. So this is given in combination and moves to frontline. Where is this going? So if this is a sex successful drug, can we make a newer second generation compound? That's really where the focus is now. And so people are really trying to look at, can you make a more effective version of this drug? So the same target CD30, but can you improve the effectiveness or maybe can you make it a little more safe? So with the chemotherapy payload, you still see some of the chemotherapy side effects like peripheral neuropathy or myelosuppression. So you can see lower blood counts and risk of infection from this. So can you try to optimize that to improve the effectiveness and make the drug more safe? A similar drug, polituzumab vidotin. So as the vidotin name may imply, it's the same chemotherapy payload. The target is different. And so CD79B is expressed very commonly in diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So this is a drug that's been approved for relapsed refractory large cell lymphoma. And if you've been following some of this, you might be aware that there's a frontline study called Polarix. And so this uh, drug does have a positive phase three study in the frontline settings showing superiority for this drug in combination with chemotherapy over our previous gold standard, our CHOP. This has led to the approval of this treatment in a few different countries in the world, including the UK and in the US. But unfortunately, despite an approval by Health Canada, this is yet to be approved by uh, our provincial payers. So that's still, I think, uh, potentially within some negotiation, but there's been some negative feedback so far. Uh, so I hope there'll still be the opportunity to have this drug in Canada available and approved and paid for, but that's still something that's being sorted out. Where's the field going with ADCs? So there are other ADCs that are still in development with different targets on the cell surface. You can see how many potential targets there, there are. And the goal now, they're trying to optimize the technology. Can you change the chemotherapy payload? Can you change what links the chemotherapy to the antibody to make this more safe? That's really where the field is moving with some of these uh, newer antibody drug conjugates or ADCs. Switching gears again, here's CAR T cell therapy. And this is one of the early studies that really demonstrated why CAR T cell therapy uh, is such a revolutionary therapy in lymphoma. And so this is looking at axicaptogene cellulosal or axis cell or what they call yes carta. Uh, so again, from kite, and this was the pivotal study that led to its approval, which showed this excellent overall survival in a disease where we expected the average person would only live a few months uh, with the standard therapies that were available before CAR T. And so with longer follow-up, this also demonstrates, you can see that curve looks relatively flat. So this speaks to the curative potential of CAR T cell and large B cell lymphoma. And this took a population of patients that was largely incurable and really changed their disease. So again, available in many places, uh, uh, publicly available and funded in Canada, I think there's still some provinces that are working through making this available locally 
but uh, this has now been available across Canada for a few years now. Where did this go? So in the second line setting, uh, we were now able to show that these therapies, CAR T cell, were superior to our gold standard in the second line. So our second line treatment historically had been chemotherapy followed by an autologous stem cell transplant. And this is one of the two studies that showed that CAR T cell was actually superior to that approach of salvage chemotherapy and stem cell transplant. So again, Health Canada approved. Uh, we've heard that the funding is uh, approved as well, but we still don't have a funding agreement in place in Canada a couple of years later. So again, hopefully we'll be ready for prime time. So again, coming down the pipeline, this is very, uh, very late in the game to say that we want to have this therapy available in Canada. We're hoping it will be available imminently from a pay payment perspective. Uh, as again, a lot of the other checks have already been made in terms of having national approval from Health Canada and having CADETH uh, approve it as well. Where else is this going? So that target CD19 is expressed across most B cell lymphomas, including follicular lymphoma. So here's the data with that same cell therapy, AxiCell and follicular lymphoma again, showing very favorable results in patients that have had multiple therapies previously. So this is one that, again, is making its way through that funding and approval process. Uh, very recently has been recommended that it should be approved and funded. I think now it's that negotiation with the provinces around how much it will cost. And so hopefully this will, this will be something that will come out of clinical trials in Canada and be available as a standard of care publicly funded in the not too distant future. So this is the data with AxiCell. Here's the data with one of the, one of the other products. So this is Tizacel. So again, a similar CAR T cell product. Again, this one's made by Novartis. The uh, co-stimulation of the CAR T cell is slightly different than with the AxiCell product. You can see here the, the results look fairly similar and look excellent. And Another one here, so this is the third product that is potentially available in this setting, Lysacel. So this is from uh, BMS, again, showing very excellent data. These are data that were just presented earlier this year, and hopefully uh, we'll be in the position that not one, not two, but ultimately three of these products might be available so that we can have a different set of options available for patients in Canada. Um, but again, a lot of data, a lot of work and effort went into making these uh, studies, completing these trials and really showing fairly convincing benefit for these, uh, for these new treatments. So where else are we moving with CAR-T in terms of developing therapy? Uh, so in relapse and refractory mantle cell lymphoma. So uh, again, another one of these products, Tocardis has been approved in Canada and it is now available. Studies that are being done now are looking at combination approaches. And again, is it possible to move this earlier in the disease course? As I mentioned earlier, we'll hopefully see approvals and funding in follicular lymphoma, hopefully with all three of those products moving forward. What's happening in, in diffuse large B cell lymphoma? So again, there, there are trials being designed and developed that are looking at doing this in the frontline setting. So really building off of our CHOP and trying to identify the highest risk patients, moving this into part of first treatment. There are other studies that are being done to better under understand if you can improve the standard of care CAR-Ts that we might do in the second or third line setting, many different approaches being looked at there. But what people are also getting very excited about are different CAR-T products. So as you saw earlier, there are many different targets and so you could say these are all CD19 directed, but there are products that are targeting CD20 or CD22 or potentially more than one target at the same time. If you're using T cells that we collect from patients, so these are autologous CAR T cells, can you use cells from a donor, what we call allogeneic cells, and are those safe? So the preliminary data are they look safe. We're hoping to see that these products may be potentially more effective because the, these T cells may be more fit than T cells that may be coming from a patient in terms of prior exposure to chemotherapy earlier in the disease or other issues like that. 
And then not just standard T cells, but can you use different types of cells, natural killer cells or gamma delta T cells that may come with different advantages or disadvantages. And so again, there are studies that are early in development with all of these things. I'll just say in the interest of time, NK cells looked very promising, but unfortunately have maybe fallen a little bit behind in the last couple of years, and we may need to look at different approaches there. Now, here's a schema to bring up this idea of if one of the reasons that uh, CAR T doesn't work as well as you're only targeting one target on the cancer cell. So could you potentially target more than one target at one time? And so in this graphic, the green cell is the tumor. And what you can see here is the example in all of these is that there's more than one target, but may, there be maybe many cell surface targets on a tumor cell. And so how do you do this? Well, you could give two different products and say, I'm going to give a CD19 targeted CAR T cell at the same time as a CD20 targeted T cell. And if I'm targeting both, that should work better. Maybe not twice as well, but you know, some additive or synergistic property there. What they call a bisystronic CAR is if the CAR has the ability to target both CD19 and 20 itself at the same time, that would be potentially a way to affect uh, the same goal from one cell, so two different targets within one cell. Cotransduction might, as you can see, achieve a similar goal, and you might be then targeting, uh, using several different cells, uh, the ability to hit those same two target antigens. And lastly, at the, at the bottom there, what they call tandem targeting. So again, within that same single car construct, could you also have it target both CD19 and CD20? And what I can tell you is that, you know, this sounds like crazy science, but it's actually all being done in the clinic as we speak. There are clinical trials running with all of these approaches that have been done and whether one will end up being better than another, well, only time will tell, but the preliminary data certainly shows that it's feasible and studies are now being done with these that might lead to the approval of these, again, hopefully in the patients that need them the most, which may be the patients that unfortunately have had their disease come back after a standard CAR-T procedure or patients that have very high risk disease where we don't think a CAR-T is going to work that well for them. So interesting things and things that we may see moving forward. What else do we see? So next to cells, again, engineering antibodies in a different may, may also be a good approach. And what you can see here is an example of what we call bispecific antibodies or bites, bispecific T cell engagers, where the idea is with an antibody, can you do what, I, what we were talking about previously? Could you somehow target a cancer cell by using an antibody to bring a T cell to the tumor cell and actually help the T cell kill the tumor cell? And so again, that might seem like very sophisticated science, it is. But what you can see here is you can pick the targets that we know about already. So again, CD19 is a standard CAR T target. Antibodies have been used in the past. CD20, again, the target is rituximab, but we've had many other antibodies to target CD20 as well. And what you see on the right of this slide are a number of different drugs that have been used to target CD3, which is found on the normal T cell that's circulating in all of us to then bring that CD3 positive T cell to the tumor cell that expresses CD19 or CD20. One of the earliest examples of this is a drug called blinatumumab, which was uh, initially developed in both lymphoma and acute leukemia, but was ultimately first approved in acute leukemia in ALL and uh, has been a very important drug in those diseases. But I'll speak to you about some of the others in lymphoma over the next uh, few slides. And what you can see here is an example with glofitimab. Sorry, I'll just go back here. And glofitimab is, uh, again, a CD3, CD20 bispecific, again, developed by Roche. And this is the trial that led to the approval of this, again, showing in patients that had very few options left, this very impressive disease control and overall survival. And this would actually have included some patients that had had CAR T cell therapy and then progressed and then needed further therapy. 
And so this, uh, again, was very promising data. And, and again, one of the first uh, of this type of treatment to be approved in, in this indication in relapsed refractory diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Here's another presentation. This is looking at epcaritimab, so another CD3, CD20 uh, bispecific antibody. Uh, this one's from a different company, so uh, Genzyme partnered with AbbVie, and this is a trial that is now uh, reported. Uh, this was presented about a year ago, and it's now published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology. And again, I'll just say very similar data showing that this type of a drug can be given in patients with refractory diffuse large cell lymphoma. You see these very encouraging response rates. Let's just say the progression-free survival looks relatively similar to what you saw in the previous study. And this, again, is a drug that is now approved by Health Canada and uh, hopefully is on its way to being funded as well. The third one I'm going to show you here is another drug. Uh, uh, this one is uh, also a CD3, CD20 bispecific, Mosuntuzumab. And uh, this drug is initially at least being developed both in diffuse large cell lymphoma and follicular lymphoma, but it is uh, going forward for approval in follicular lymphoma. And what you can see here is the comparison in blue, how well the drug performed in terms of how long you could stay in complete remission on the left and standard progression-free survival, so being alive and in remission on the right, versus the prior treatment. And it's always very encouraging to see that this does better than a previous treatment. So that was the limit of this study. There is, this isn't a comparison against a standard, but really showed that it was probably changing the effect of the follicular lymphoma, because if anything, treatments tend, uh, subsequent treatments tend to be associated with poorer responses and shorter time in remission, where here we're seeing the opposite. And so these are data that'll lead to the approval of this drug, hopefully in Canada in the not too distant future. So the world of bites, you know, we have Canadian approvals in diffuse large cell lymphoma for glofitimab and epcaritimab. We'll hopefully see approvals for follicular lymphoma with mosentuzumab as an example, hopefully sometime in the future. In terms of this coming down the pipeline, what's happening? So there are ongoing studies in relapsed refractory disease. These are largely combinations with chemotherapy. Uh, or novel therapies, and those comparisons are being done now, phase three studies against standard of care, which is often traditional chemotherapy. And frontline studies are now just getting up and running where these very innovative drugs are gonna be combined and tested versus our CHOP, again, our gold standard for a long time. So where is the action? So the action are in these combination studies that are being taken forward, potentially even in the frontline setting, as I mentioned. But we're also looking at new bites. And I think that a really exciting thing here is you can use bispecific antibodies to potentially engage other cells, not just T cells. So again, NK cells are an example. And again, this drug from Afimed called AFM13 is an example of that type of a NK engaging cell treatment. And there may be many other targets, so not just CD19 or CD20, there may be many other targets that can be tested. And now that we've seen how effective these drugs are in lymphoma, and we know they're also effective in many other cancers, just like with CAR-T, we're seeing these roll out in multiple myeloma, in solid tumors, and hopefully this will be, uh, again, another big revolution in terms of how we use immunotherapy more broadly in the cancer field. Now, I'm going to tell you one more story in the interest of time, looking at intracellular targets. And I'll say we've had so much success with these extracellular uh, molecules and using antibodies and cells that I'd say now intracellular targets are, are one of the more challenging areas we get, we get into. And by example, when you look at how complex this diagram is, how many downstream um, uh, things are in play, how these signaling pathways may talk to each other and how resistance may crop up in potentially many different ways. I'd say these intracellular uh, targets are, are very difficult and making small molecules that may target this might in a way actually be a little more complicated than making antibodies in 2023. But that being said, these are drugs and, and uh, therapies that have been studied for many years. 
And I'll say, compared to what I just showed you, these are drugs that for many types of lymphoma have had muted success. And you can look at some drugs, BCL2 inhibitors, PI3 kinase inhibitors, some of these other things, mTOR, JAK-STAT signaling pathway inhibitors or SICK inhibitors, modest activity, or there was toxicity that lead to, led to discontinuation of these drugs. And that's a, a very broad series of statements, but when you looked in certain settings, these, game, these drugs were very game-changing. And when you look at Bruton's tyrosine kinase or BTK inhibitors as an example, these drugs didn't work that well in large cell lymphoma or follicular lymphoma, but they were incredibly active in CLL, in mantle cell, in Waldenstrom's or lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma. And they really have revolutionized how we treat those diseases. And similarly, venetoclax, a BCL2 inhibitor, and now next generation compounds have also changed the game in CLL as well. And I'm gonna tell you an example again, in terms of what's coming down the pipeline using BTK inhibitors as the proof of concept. And abrutinib, so I think many of you, whether you've had CLL or have been a, a family member of a patient with CLL, might have heard about this, these, these drugs or this drug in particular. It was a first in class drug. It had excellent activity. The phase one looked stunningly good. There were very quick phase twos in CLL and mantle cell lymphoma that led to the approval of this drug. It has a very reasonable toxicity platform, it could be given in older patients with other comorbidities. But you could say if there's one great drug, could it be beaten? And say, how do you refine a drug that already works well? And so in the next couple of slides, I'm going to give you a, a bit of an example about how this works. And so firstly, on the left, these are what we call uh, kinome screens, where the red dots represent, or the red circles represent the activity of the drug on a variety of different kinases. So these are enzymes that may be doing various things in cells. And a clean drug would have one circle because it only targets one thing. And so the important thing to realize is even though these are drugs that have been designed quite carefully, they often have more than one effect. And you can see ibrutinib versus these other two drugs, acalabrutinib or xanabrutinib, what you can see is that ibrutinib looks like it's a little more dirty in terms of its effect on many other kinases Acalabrutinib looks like it, it's a little cleaner and it has effects only on a few, and xanabrutinib appears to be somewhere in between the two. So that's what the preclinical studies show, but you know, let's do a clinical trial to really say. So, uh, so again, these were drugs that went through tests to look at efficacy, establish the dose, look at safety, and then ultimately companies were brave enough to do head-to-head -head comparisons. And so what I'm showing you on this slide is in Waldenstrom's where abrutinib was compared with xanabrutinib. And what you can see, I've quickly summarized some of the findings here. So the drugs look to be similar in terms of effectiveness. So does the disease go into remission well enough? So this is 100 patients roughly in each arm. But what you see from a toxicity standpoint is that xanabrutinib does appear to have a better toxicity platform. And so uh, lower rates of atrial fibrillation, so a heart rhythm problem, lower rates of diarrhea, lower rates potentially of bleeding, lower rates of high blood pressure, though higher rates of neutropenia. And so when you think about this in combination, you get the sense that if these toxicities might be a problem for a specific patient, you may prefer one drug over another. And if you look at all of it in total, maybe xanabrutinib has a better toxicity profile compared to ibrutinib, though both were equally effective in terms of controlling the disease. In a similar type of study, so this is acalabrutinib versus ibrutinib in CLL, in relapsed refractory CLL. And what you see again here is the idea that, um, or this is actually an untreated CLL, but what you see here is that the drugs appear to be very similar in terms of the, their disease control. Those curves are superimposable in the top, but in the bottom, looking at one of the key side effects, which again is this rapid heart rate called atrial fibrillation, you're far more likely to be on the drug if, and stay on it if you have a calibrutinib versus a brutinib. And again, this is one of the other studies that again, you take excellent drugs, you see some differences in the safety profile with a second generation drug, and that may lead us to favoring that drug, in this case, acalabrutinib versus abrutinib because of this heart side effect. 
so looking at this, you know, this is another way that the the platform gets moved forward or what comes down the pipeline trials that show that you can build on the efficacy have that maintained but change the toxicity thus making this a better choice for specific patients and i think choice here is an important one how do you how do you improve on this and how do you improve on therapy with btk so we know that one of the mechanisms of resistance with btk inhibitors is actually mutations where the drug binds to the BTK or the Bruton's tyrosine kinase in particular. And so how do you change that? Well, that may be an effect of how the drug binds to its target. And even looking beyond that, could you potentially think of a different way of targeting BTK entirely? And so uh, here's an example. So pertubrutinib is a, again, a next generation BTK inhibitor that's selective and as opposed to covalently binds, it non-covalently binds, which means it reversibly binds BTK. And this seems to work in people that have BTK mutations, but it may also work uh, just as well or potentially even better in patients that haven't had a BTK inhibitor before. And so here's, again, you look at that kinome screen that I show you in the top left corner of this diagram, and it looks to be very selective for BTK. And you see these favorable efficacy results. And we've seen that this drug is becoming uh, available uh, in many countries over, around the world. And there has been uh, previously compassionate access uh, to pertubrutinib in Canada, and hopefully we'll have funding. And here, let's look even a little more to the future. What's next? So instead of binding BTK, perhaps you can just chew it up and get rid of it. So the next class of compounds that are developed are going to be able to target a protein, you get it to bind, and then we have a natural garbage system, what we call ubiquitination, where you can take that protein that you've targeted for degradation, and then it goes to the proteasome, which is ultimately like the garbage of the cell, the garbage mechanism of the cell, and then it chews it up and gets rid of it. And so targeted protein degradation is going to be a very new and novel and very exciting way of drugging targets. And these classes of drugs are called protax, so prote proteolysis targeting chimeras. So these are chimeras because they combine a couple of different functions that ultimately lead to degradation of the protein. So drugs are now in early clinical trials, and the first examples are actually degraders of BTK, so building on the concept of targeting BTK. And, and I think we will hopefully see this ultimately become successful and have many other drugs available. So what is coming down the pipeline now to summarize therapies being tested in other lymphomas, therapies being tested earlier in the disease, better versions of those therapies, new targets, entirely new ways of treating cancer. So I'd say it's a very exciting time for clinical trials because there are many great new options that look very promising. But also remember, uh, you know, if you're a patient or a family member out there, Lymphoma, there, we have very many standard options that are excellent. Um, and I apologize, uh, it's very hard to cover every single type of lymphoma and all of the potential scenarios and drugs that may be out there in one presentation. But the goal was to give you a flavor of where some things are going. Um, certain clinical trials, certain drugs may be available to specific patients in specific scenarios. Uh, and that's a conversation you need to have with the team that is looking after you or a referral to an expert center for consideration of a specific study. Challenges remain. So there's still opportunities for us to be better with drug development. Again, I did not talk a lot about T cell lymphoma there today, but that's an area where we need to have more innovative approaches. I have touched on drugs that may or may not be available in Canada, and there are challenges around our funding. And so advocacy, so where Lymphoma Canada plays a big role, advocacy is something that we still need uh, because you can see all of the challenges of trying to navigate this complex system to bring a drug ultimately into the standard of care setting. And we also have to accept that in some cases, again, even the richest country in the world probably can't pay for anything. Canada is not the richest country in the world and we can't pay for everything. So there is some judgment that will go into that. And so to conclude, you know, the pipeline in lymphoma, I think has led to major improvements in the care of patients over the past decade or two. Treatments are more effective, they're better tolerated, there's been substantial patient benefit. I think hopefully I've shown you in this very quick presentation 
it's a challenging and complicated endeavor. Clinical trials are central to this. And uh, remember to ask about them and see if they're potentially available to you if these are things that are of interest to you. And so with that, uh, I'm happy to stop. Uh, I think I ran a couple minutes late, but uh, we should be able to have lots of time for questions, I think in the next 10 minutes. Thank you so much, uh, for Brenda, for your presentation. Actually, we have a few questions already. Uh, we received them, and we'll start with the first question, uh, which is, uh, does every person that gets diagnosed with lymphoma uh, got the testing to identify genetic marks uh, you talked about? Uh, I don't remember having these tests. Yeah, so again, a very good question. Now, just to be careful, uh, so I talked about a lot of different things and I wasn't just talking about genetic mutations, right? So some of these things are cell surface markers that might be very commonly done on a routine pathology report that comes up. Now, uh, where I work, uh, it's an electronic medical record. Patients see their pathology reports, so they get a lot of detail. And admittedly, these are things that may not be discussed if they're not relevant. And so as an example, uh, if I know CD20 is all, always expressed on a lymphoma, I may not tell someone that even though they're getting rituximab, which targets CD20. Uh, but if it's a relevant marker, if it's a question that comes up, so in a T-cell lymphoma, CD30 might be only expressed in certain T-cell lymphomas. It's important to know it might be available then for a treatment, brentuximab that targets CD30. So that might be a relevant question where it's important that that gets discussed. Um, genetic testing in general, I'll say in lymphoma, uh, we do it when it is relevant. Uh, if it's gonna be involved in decision-making, it doesn't happen uniformly. And so for that reason, it may not always be discussed. Thank you so much. Uh, actually, we have uh, some more questions, but uh, unfortunately we ran out of time for the questions. So we'll try to answer these questions, to send them uh, to attendees with the uh, presentation and the uh, concluding email for this uh, session. So thanks all uh, uh, to, to attending this uh, seminar uh, and uh, um, stay tuned for the next session titled How Novel uh, Therapy Are Approved in Canada, which will be um, starting in, a few, in the next few minutes. Thank you so much, everyone. I got, uh, I took notes about the uh, questions that you were not able to answer in this session and we'll try to answer all these questions and send it by email. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.